So what I want to do today is take you to the place of the world where people are living the longest life. And I want to share with you some of the lessons that we learned that we brought back here to America. I want to talk to you about how we're doing it to improve the health and wellness of people living here in America. So I grew up really near here. I have three older brothers. My mother was blessed with four boys. Just ask her. I'm sure she'll tell you. <laughs> uh, two of which held Guinness Book of World Records for long-distance biking. They went from Alaska to Argentina. It's all downhill, so it's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> they went from St. Paul to Minneapolis a long way via Siberia, Russia. Uh, was, I don't think it was coincidental that they left on April Fool's Day. And through Africa, which was the first one that I did until I caught malaria at an inopportune time. And it was on this trip that my brother Dan said something to me, something that I'll always remember. He said he learned more about the world and his relationship to that world in 12 months on the seat of a bike than he did in 12 years of formal education. Now, not to say that formal education is bad, but there's a lot to learn when you step out of that environment that you're comfortable with and into somebody else's environment that you might not be comfortable with. And what it did is it started this desire for me to travel, to see the world and to bring back lessons. Um, went and studied the Maya, went down into the Amazon rainforest where I met with the Machiginga Indians. I uh, did song lines in Australia. I uh, led a couple uh, trade missions to, uh, with former governors. I even went to Africa where I looked at the impact of sports on HIV and hunger. And then I helped my brother build a, a project called Blue Zones, where we traveled the world to try to find the pockets in the world where people are living the longest life, a place where at 102 they're still riding their bike, at 104 they're actively chopping wood, and they can beat somebody 65 years their junior in arm wrestling. <laughs> the, the guy on the left is my brother Dan. I don't know if anybody here has an older brother, but it's, it's really disheartening when that guy that you look up to just gets whooped. <laughs> I didn't tease him, but. So what we were able to do is to find the five demographically confirmed places in the world where people are living the longest life. Uh, we go there with researchers, so you might notice that that place in Russia where they're drinking a bottle of vodka a day and a couple packs of heaters didn't make the list. So we'll go in there with the team and really try to research it really try to understand what were the commonalities, and then we took those commonalities, those lifestyle traits, and we're bringing them here to America. Uh, as you know, probably a lot of communities are really trying to become healthier, about a thousand of us, a thousand of them wanted us to come in, but we chose 28 that we're working with around America, and we've had some good success. Uh, reduced smoking by 30% in one community. Um, in the beach cities in LA, we reduced childhood obesity uh, cut it in half. Um, city health care worker claims in Albert Lee went down by 40%, even less hospital visits in Iowa. Um, but what I want to do today is kind of share with you a couple of things that we learned on the Blue Zones and how we're bringing them here to America. Starting with, they moved naturally. Um, whether it was for their job as shepherds, where they kind of move all day long, it's a low-impact exercise, where they're gardening for that hobby, kind of growing food, again, low-impact. Um, around their house, they take care of kind of uh, the job by themselves. They continue to, they wouldn't hire somebody to mow the lawn, to shovel the walk. Met a woman, 104 years old, in Costa Rica, that was mowing her lawn with a machete when I met her. Can you imagine that? I kind of thank my dad for not making me do that as a kid. <laughs> So what we tried to do is to try, the other thing we saw is their communities, instead of sprawling like we are here in America, they come together as a community. It's easy to be able to walk to their friend's house, to be able to bike um, to the downtown, to create those population centers that are easy to get to. The kids walk to school. So what we tried to do with the Blue Zones is that same type of thing. We went down to Albert Lee back in 2009. They wanted to widen Main Street and increase the speed limit, which is a great thing to do if you want cars buzzing through the middle of town, right? But if you want a place where kids can recreate, is it a good idea? So we looked at the end of the block, and they had this beautiful lake. But there's no way to get around it. So we talked them into using the money to build a walking path. And now you go there any time out of the year, and people are moving. They're walking. 
They're joining, they're spending the evening with their friends. You don't have to buy anybody a gym membership. Um, do me a favor, raise your hand if you walked to school when you were a kid. Now raise your hand if your kid or your grandkid walks to school. So why have we taken that exercise out of our kid's life? I know, it's, I know the answer, but what we tried to do is solve it with walking school buses, <laughs> where we had the kids dropped off about 10 blocks from the school, either by the parents or by the bus, created safe walks to, uh, safe, um, walks to school for the kids, brought in principals, brought in teachers, brought in parents to walk with the kids, even got a retired adults that were looking for something to do to kind of help those kids get to school, but they got exercise before the school, and they also created friends, which I think was important. So we know from the Framingham research at Isolation Kills, according to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, 20 years ago, the average American had three best friends. It's now down to a friend and a half, and if you can tell me where you get that half a friend. <laughs> but according to that same report, they also said that if people have less than three friends, they're defined as lonely. And that has the same impact on your health as smoking a pack of cigarettes. In Okinawa, what they did is they created these things called moais. At the age of five, your parents will put you in groups with other kids. They'll cultivate those relationships. So when you reach 20, you have a strong foundation. I mean, the reason I'm showing you this image are these five women have been part of the same moai for 97 years. Their average age is 102. They get together every night. They drink our mori, the Okinawan whiskey. They, they eat the sobe noodles. They even argue about who that guy liked best back in 1939. <laughs> it was me. But it's incredibly stressful even to travel through life with somebody there to support you. The woman on the left, she told me the first thing she does in the morning is she slides open her door and she looks to make sure that her friend's doors are open. If there's not, she goes out there, hey, are you all right? How are you doing? You're supporting each other as a community. And we try to do that same thing in the blue zones, where down in the beach cities, we created these things called, we created these moais, where we tried to get people to come together one time a week for 30 minutes with a group of people that they didn't know, about eight to 10 people, around a healthy activity like walking or, or eating. Uh, 1,700 people came together in these communities. One lady here, Joan, she told me that her, her husband, 85 years old, would not have walked without somebody helping. Said, Aren't we like that? I mean, discipline only takes you so far, right? Um, another lady, Joan, what she told me is that she moved to Florida from New York, had no friends, and now she had a group of friends. And not only could she walk with, but two years later, her husband got ill. And now she had a support network to help her through that. She belonged. Um, around healthy eating, got together once a week to eat healthy. Guy here, Bill, he um, reduced his uh, uh, caloric count by 100 by coming together around healthy eating with another group of people, reinforcing those healthy behaviors. Um, this woman right here, March Deton, she's from Loma Linda, 104 years old. She'd get up every morning, She'd read her Bible, she'd eat oatmeal raisins, same breakfast she's had for years. She chases it down with what she calls a prune juice shooter. <laughs> I'll let you guys think about what that is and just push that image out of your head. Uh, she exercises every day, but more importantly, she jumps in her root beer colored Cadillac DeVille where she still <laughs> volunteers for seven different organizations, including, in her words, not mine, the Loma Linda Old Folks Home. <laughs> Now, she said something that I always remember. She kind of scooted over and said, you know what? I feel sexier at 104 than I did at 103. <laughs> now, think about that. Is that what you imagine 104 feeling like? Is that what it should feel like? So we tried to create that same sense of purpose down in the beach cities. This woman, Annette, when we came down to the project, she lost three family members. She was very depressed. She not only did this thing we call the Blue Zone Pledge, but she joined a Moai, got friends. Uh, she uh, quit a smoking habit that she had for 22 years. But I think more importantly, what she started doing was volunteering in the community to give back. She kind of bought into our message around healthy eating, started working with the grocery stores. At the end, I asked Annette, how do, how do you feel about the project? 
And what she said is, I'm not going to cry. She said it with watery eyes. But she said, I have my social life back. I've realized the importance of coming together to give back. So what are we doing to come together to give back as a community? And the last thing I wanted to mention is around food. They tended to eat really healthy in the Blue Zone communities compared to what we eat here. You know, 50 gallons on average of soda pop, 200 pounds of meat, um, 91 pounds of sugar a year. You compare that with the average Blue Zone diet, and it's, it's vastly different. They eat a lot healthier in the Blue Zones than the places that we travel. So what we tried to do is say, hey, instead of that individual discipline, how do we get people to come together again around healthy eating and have the community support it? So down in Albert Lee, the businesses said, we want to step up. The work sites, how do we change the food environment in the work sites? Restaurants came together to change their menus to offer healthy alternatives. Uh, Brian Wozniak, the guy on the right, what he said, it's just change the environment. You don't have to, every place doesn't have to be vegetarian, but is anybody like me, when they give you that basket of bread, you slather butter on it, and you eat it down, by the time your food comes, you're full? What he said, well, instead of bringing it as a default, why don't you let the customer ask for it? Make the healthy choice the easy choice. So we worked with restaurants to do that, to maybe instead of fries, do healthy fruit. Um, we worked with grocery stores to try to tag the healthy food. Um, what's the last thing you see in the grocery store when you leave? Is it that healthy food? No, so we blue zone the checkout lane. So when that kid said, I want this, I want this, can I have it? It's usually an apple or a banana. And the restaurants and the grocery stores loved it because they were still making, it didn't, it didn't hurt their bottom line at all. So I want to leave you guys with just one last thought. So I don't think I have to tell anybody here that right now in America we have a health care crisis. If current trends continue, over 70% obese, over 50% are going to have diabetes. We spend over $2 trillion a year to fight diseases that are curable. For the first time in history, the life expectancy of our kids is going to be less of that of our own. Now, why is that? Is it because we're, our parents were better parents than we were because they loved us more? No. Our environment has changed. You can't fill up your tank of gas, you can't walk through a grocery store, you can't turn on the TV without being bombarded by unhealthy messages. And individual responsibility is important, and discipline is important. But discipline is a muscle, and muscles eventually fatigue, and eventually you break down and you grab that Snickers bar. Now, the answer, I don't think, lies in Washington. It doesn't lie with large pharmaceuticals. I think it lies with our communities to come together, to look around the world, to to where people are growing old in ways that we emulate. For us to come together as a community, with our work sites, with our business owners, parents, with kids of all ages, to come together as a community around the health and wellness of each other, around the health and wellness of the community, so that we can wake up one day, look at that person lying next to you and say, you know what, I kind of feel sexier at 104 than I did at 103. <laughs> Thank you very much.